Well, I think I think we have enough folks here that we'll get started. So uh, since you're seeing Erin, um, she is the originator of all of this good stuff. And I'm the lucky one who gets to continue it on. Uh, my name's Craig Sharton. So I am the entrepreneur ecosystem facilitator for uh, 10 at the top. And actually, that's the first time I think I said it without stumbling on one of the three words. So we have that recorded just in case for posterity. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully I've met met with most of you, I believe. Um, part of the the role is to have the the UEE, the uh, Upstate um, Entrepreneur Ecosystem, um, have quarterly get-togethers, and it's really focused on helping uh, the agencies or the people, the organizations, the businesses, the people that are really serving entrepreneurs in the upstate. So we want to bring in resources so that the people that are helping the entrepreneurs can be as successful as possible in helping those entrepreneurs. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and I'll get a little bit into our speaker in just a few more minutes. He's on online with us here. Um, but I do want to show you one of the resources that we have is Oh, you disabled my my uh, screen sharing since I gave it to you, David. All right, I'll pass it back. All right, thank you very much. I've lost control. All right, so one of the, the resources that we have that I just, I'll probably remind everyone about every single time is the Start, Grow, Upstate uh, dot com website and so we've just had it refreshed um so we've got all the nice tools over here um so if you go to startgrowupstate.com um really the couple of things one uh go ahead and add yourself um on the site you can register yourself you can register your organization um, make if your organization's already registered, then go ahead and take a look at it. Make sure everything is accurate and up to date, and then just kind of play around with it. Um, the idea, again, to help uh, build out our entrepreneurial ecosystem is to be able to provide resources that help people get to get to the things they need as quickly and easily as possible. So this is a really good catch-all for resources, and you can feel comfort comfortable about sending anyone who says, hey, I'm interested in starting a business, or I did start a business, send them over here, um, and it's an easy way for them to access it. And really, we have I, I'm amazed at how many entrepreneurs we have that are using this site. So it's working really well, and, and we just want to keep developing it and making it better. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we have all of your information in here. There's no reason not to. There's no charge to put it in. I have so a quick question. Sorry, I'm not being annoying. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I yeah. see there's a new section called guides. Yeah, play around with that. All right. So how... Um... They just right. put it in. They just added it. So... Okay. We're still figuring that we're still figuring that segment out. Okay, good. I'll play with it. Thanks. Yep. And then uh and then we'll see about how we can we can uh, combine that in with our navigator program. So and that's really the 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 next thing is that we're in the second cohort of our navigator program which kind of aligns with the start grow uh upstate website is for different communities around the upstate, especially the rural communities, but really all of them, uh, to have certain people that will be go-to navigators so that if someone in the community says, I know this person that wants to start a business, you say, you know, you should have them go to see Stephen Hayduck over at Wesleyan 
uh, Southern Wesleyan University because he's gone through the navigator training and he knows about all of the resources or Michael Mino who's going through both of those uh, folks are going through it now. Um, and so what they're doing and what you might be interested in doing if you're on this uh, if you're on this webinar is you know it's it's about a six or seven week deep dive into all of the different resources that are available from private investors to CDFIs, community development financial institutions to SBDC score, SCMEP. Um, it really is, it's more than just kind of an overview presentation about what the organizations do. Um, the navigators are really clear about wanting to know, you know, which which resource do I send this entrepreneur to? And knowing which, uh, what kind of entrepreneurs the, the resources want referred to them. So, you know, if they're looking for a loan or an investment or, uh, you know, free service on just how to do market research, like they're learning where all of those different resources are and, and uh, what the appetite is for the organization to serve those entrepreneurs. So, um, if you're interested in the future of being one of those folks, go ahead and send an email to me or to anyone here at 10 at the top saying you're interested in becoming a navigator. And as we begin um, planning out the next cohort, um, we'd be happy to, to have you join us. But I think Stephen or Michael could kind of talk about what the experience has been like for them. I didn't tell you I'd call on you. I didn't plan on it. So... I know that you're uh, you're fast at thinking on your feet, um, but what has it been like for you, Stephen or Michael? Stephen, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I'll note that my background is not uh, really a business or entrepreneurship. For so for me, it's been um, both like drinking from a fire hose, and it's also been very enlightening in terms of seeing what. Um, resources are available and being able to make uh, connections with people. So it's been very helpful um, in uh, what I do. Um, I'm chair of the School of Business, which includes entrepreneurship and social science at Southern Western University. Thank you. And Michael, you have been around these entrepreneurial ecosystems. What's your take so far? Well, I mean, first of all, I thought I knew everything and I learned how much I still have to learn. So that's been great. But I think probably the thing that was the biggest, uh, I don't know, shocker is the right word, but it was fun to watch some of the presenters who were in the ecosystem not knowing each other. And so not only is the program you're you and uh, Aaron are putting together helping us navigators, but I think What's the word I might use? The navigated or the nav? Let's see. Let me think. <laughs> what's, what's the right term? <laughs> <laughs> Navigatees? Navigatees, yes. I mean, so it's been really fun to, to watch both sides. Yeah, we're kind of make, making up words here as we go. That's what entrepreneurs would do, right, Michael? That's what we do. Yep. And, and Craig, this was before your time, but Laura Hudson is one of the met one of the navigators from the first cohort in Greenwood. And sorry, Laura, to kind of call on you. <laughs> yep, she's right. No she's worries, right. no worries. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. It's a little busy in my office today. Um, yeah, so we were the first group to go through. We were Aaron's guinea pigs. Um, I think we did very well for being the guinea pigs. But um, we, uh, Case Self Advision Greenwood is leading our efforts as we continue to move forward. We're looking at possibly... Um, in the next little bit, maybe towards the end of summer, doing another class. Um, but we are in the midst right now of working with Kim Bowman on our DEE roadmap. Um, and we actually are looking at buying a building for our innovation center. So moving pretty quickly, pretty um, rapidly there. Um, but yeah, it's been great. Um, and it's a great program. I encourage everybody to take advantage of it. Yeah, and so as we've been kind of focusing on different areas, like Greenwood, like Lara said, was the first, and now we're working on Pickens County. Um, we're going to do up in Gaffney as well, but we're going to do one uh, cohort that is really anyone in the upstate from an ad hoc, uh, an ad hoc cohort, 
uh, to be able to get everyone in who wants this training. And it really has been phenomenal. And and I know that we have some SBDC folks on here and they get tired of me bragging about them, but I've worked with SBDCs all over um, the country and uh, well, from coast to coast for sure. And um, this SBDC that we have here is just as better than any I've seen. So um, sometimes I, I say when you're when you're in a place and you've only used this SBDC, you might not know how they compare to to others around the country, but I've just found this group to be phenomenal. So um, as well as as the other presenters that we've had, but um, I think it's just really top notch, very high level resources that we have in our community. So um, as a person who's still relatively new, um, I can tell you that I, I've just been blown away with how, how great these guys are and, and just knowledgeable and just obviously a huge passion to, to help these businesses get up and running and, and having them be successful. <laughs> and Dean asks if I'm, I'm paying Earl, I, you know, I'm hoping to get, you know, maybe a, a lunch out of it someday, but so far hasn't come through. I'll just keep doing it. Do I'm trying to do it till they're annoyed and embarrassed. So uh, I think I'm getting pretty close to that that line. So um, I want to let you know what the next uh, UEE meeting we're doing one a quarter. I'm working on it. I was hoping to have a date, but I'm working on one of the presenters trying to nail down a, a schedule but it's gonna be a panel discussion and we'll have a live meeting. So these won't all be on Zoom. Um, and it is going to be about how entrepreneurs can use media. So as the resources are on here, as they're serving the businesses, we'll have an actual news director from a TV station, a newspaper publisher, and then uh, people from digital media um, and they'll walk through the process of if you wanted to develop a story and get it on TV about a, bu your, a business, your business, an event, something like that, how would you get that information out to develop that story in a way that would work for TV news, printed media, social media, Yeah, not your own social media, but through people that are developing social media content. Um, so it'll be very specific to how an entrepreneur would benefit by being able to use uh, free media. So, and uh, and we'll do it in a fun location too. So I know we're starting on Zoom because we have a speaker who's coming in from across the country for us, but uh, we want to um, also have some live events now that, now that we can. And I, I want to hang out with you guys anyway. So that'll be fun. Um, why don't we do some quick introductions? I think we have just enough time if we wanna go through and um, just say who you are and, and who you're affiliated with. Why don't we start with, I'll just call on you. David Doherty. I am a community navigator, business consultant connected to uh, uh, the SBDC uh, at the Columbia office and do small business consulting in the upper half of South Carolina. I have 22 counties that uh, I currently serve. I have so far about 73 clients. Thank you. And he was also a presenter at our navigators. Joey. Good afternoon. Hi, Joey Loman, Synergy Mill Community Workshop. And uh, I connect people and help them make things. Yeah, he has a fantastic maker space. They do everything from craftsmanship to very high tech. And we had dinner just last night, so I'm surprised he's even on. You're not sick of me yet. Melissa. Are you there? Let's go to Earl and we'll go back to Melissa when I see her clicking on. Hey, everybody. 
Earl Gregorich. I'm the area manager for the SPDC here in Greenville. And uh, I keep entrepreneurial dreams from becoming nightmares. That's what I do. That's great. Great tagline. Stephen, you introduced yourself, but go ahead and just. I'll just say it again. I'm, I'm uh, chair of the School of Business and Social Science at Southern Western University. Uh, by training, I'm actually a research psychologist with the interest background in uh, machine learning. Michelle Willis. Hi, so, um, I'm Michelle Willis. Um, I am with the City of Greer Economic Development Department, and our major initiative is the Platform at Greer, which is an entrepreneurial support organization. So glad to be here. Excited to have you. Dr. Holcomb. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Lee Holcomb. I'm the CEO of Career Catalyst Edge. I provide career coaching for professionals that work in biotech and pharma companies. So Earl actually was the first person that I talked to in the ecosystem about starting a company. So I just want to say, Earl, I got a message today that one of my clients just got an offer letter with a new job, with a sign-on bonus. So thank you for not letting my entrepreneurial dreams go up in flames. Um, I'm also a graduate of, of GVL Start. So I was in the second cohort. So uh, trying to be part of this community. So thanks for the invite, Greg. Oh, and my other interest is neurodiversity in the workplace. So I'm a neuroscientist by training, and um, that's my outreach this year, especially is um, ADHD, dyslexia, and uh, dyscalculia, autism. Uh, how do people get into the workforce, and how do we work well as uh, a company with somebody that's neurodivergent? And we're both on the RISE board together. Melissa, I see you on. I didn't know you were driving. Sorry about that. Oh, you got your mute on, but I want you to be safe. Safe. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm Melissa Everett. I'm executive director of Sustainable Hudson Valley, which is upstate in a different state, namely New York. And yeah. I had read David Ehrlichman's book and was poking around for a speaking engagement or some way to plug into his work to um, solidify a network that came out of a uh, climate action planning initiative in the Hudson Valley of New York that has a business network as a big component of it. And um, next thing I knew, I was bubbling into being your guest to listen to this presentation. So thank Great. you. Great, welcome. <laughs> Looks like you have the same weather there that we're having here. All right, uh, let's see who we have next. Michael, you want to? Yes, Michael Mino. Um, I'm trying to think of how I can connect uh, Joey with uh, Michelle and Earl in terms of entrepreneurial dreams instead of, uh, how, I guess I'm on some intersection of those. So my, I've been involved in a lot of different startups and I'm at a stage of life where I'm trying to help others as I have been helped through the years. And uh, I'm most uh, specifically uh, working with the city of Greer and Michelle um, on their platform program. And so we've got a lot of, I don't know, at some point it might be good for us to have kind of a little navigator-esque um, uh, thing where we each get to talk maybe uh, three minutes on you know, what our, our things are, kind of like the navigator program, but maybe for the... Um, the providers that are here, but um, we do the boot camp and ignite and the huddle. And this uh, Thursday, Michelle, I can I'm surprised she's here because the last time I saw her, she was her hair was like this, getting ready for the uh, summit this week. So, um, if if any of you are interested, uh, Thursday at five thirty, uh, Michelle. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put something in the chat real quick so people yeah, can great. learn about it. We'd love to have you guys. That'd be great. They do such a great job. I'm so impressed. Yeah, they do. David? Hey, uh, David White. And uh, I am a founder and a CEO for Fostering Great Ideas, which is all about improving foster care for children. The reason I'm interested in this subject matter is because we convene people to help children in new ways. 
become a foster parent or, or not, but we will help you to get involved in the child's life. That's what I'm here. And across a lot of networks. Sounds good. Lynn? Muted, yep. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Craig, for inviting me today. Um, I'm a local business owner here. We have a family credit card processing agency called the A-Team. And I also send out a free weekly newsletter with all the upstate South Carolina networking events in the area. So if you'd like to be on the email list or you want your event added to the email list, text me, call me, or get in touch with me. Craig has my information too. And I will add that it is a phenomenal a source of information. And somehow we need to get Lynn connected with the Start Grow uh, website. If somehow or other we could take all of her hard work and give it another outlet, that would be phenomenal. Oh, I'd love that, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, I've been meaning to meet with you too. I met with Taylor last week. So <laughs> I'd love to get involved with the, the Start Grow Network for sure. Cool. Be great. Yeah. So Lynn, you can go onto the Start Grow site and create your own profile and okay. upload your own information. Oh, that's easy. It's created to be um, somewhat self-directed so that y'all can all own your own um, content. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you. Yes. And But set aside 20 to 30 minutes to get it all on there because it's, okay. it's exhaustive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Craig, we can work on that Friday. I was going to say, what, Lynn, and I, <laughs> Lynn and I have a meeting on Friday. <laughs> And I would say, if at all possible, I mean, it is just, I don't know, I can't imagine how much time she spent pulling that together, but if there's some way for her to import it, because she does this every week to update it. So anyways, I'll let you guys work it out. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Hudson. I'm with the City of Greenwood, and I'm the Community and Economic Development Director. Um, I also work alongside K-Self with Vision Greenwood. On a lot of entrepreneurial um, just different programs we run the brew together um, and like I said we're working um, on our DE roadmap now um, and we work with just a lot of different entrepreneurs in the community happy to be here great John I'm um, John Warner I have an organization called InnoVenture uh, we ran uh, 10 Interventure and Intermobility conferences over about a decade. And we are in the process of organizing a South by Southwest type of event in downtown Greenville. We're calling the Interventures Future Festival. So we hope to have the first inaugural event in September and the first uh, multi day event sometime in 2024. Great. We should, we should yeah, I'll, I'm going to contact you afterward. And uh, that just gave me an idea of something I might be able to partner with you on. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? If Kathy's not there, I'll switch over to Matthew. Hey, everybody. Uh, Matthew Myers. I am, uh, sorry about that. I just realized I wasn't on camera. Um, I am a uh, city exec for South State Bank uh, over in Spartanburg. Thank you. Kathy? Yes, yeah, so I apologize. Um, That's right. But I did put a picture so you all could see me. It was um, a new business uh, entrepreneur nonprofit named for our parents, been in existence about a year, going to the second year. Our biggest um, strategy is building this um, 18, 1900 square foot building where we can do some educational awareness, um, and other career building programs for the people within where I was born and raised in Pickens here. Um, and so I'm just very interested in what it is that you're saying, how it is. We, we have our second fundraising event coming up in September. And so I'm glad to be on here to get even more education and more networking to you all. Thank you. Well, we're happy to have you. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Roberts. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I don't know why I'm here, to tell you the truth. I saw the flyer and I thought it was interesting. And um, being a mayor, um, I heard someone say they're connectors and 
we're trying to do so i heard the brew and we have the brew and we've started um um we have an incubator that we're trying to get off the ground and and so i just wanted to hear what was going on and, and plus i've um uh, this july I'd be a small business owner state farm agent for 35 years so i'm interested in all of that dialogue and Craig, if I might interrupt, and Aaron, you might remember, Terrence, weren't you at the uh, Kaufman, um, gosh, what, what was the ecosystem conference? Gosh, when was that? Like eight years ago, five, seven years ago? No? Did you get some mayor summit? Yeah. Out in uh, Kansas City. No? Okay. I don't You just sound so familiar to me. The, the mayor of Holly Hill was there? From South Carolina? That might be who you're thinking. Uh, you're uh, muted, uh, Terrence. I think Bill Johnson it was the mayor of Holly Hill. I think he got defeated maybe the last term. But um, that's, that's probably right. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. We have Philip, and then we'll, we'll introduce Dean last, and then we'll jump over to our speaker. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's so interesting. I see a lot of folks on here I've connected with over the past few years in some form and fashion. So it's great to be on here and great to have dinner with you last night, Craig, too. So thank you for being there. So I'm Phil McCry with uh, Beer and Napkins. Been around as a side gig for about 10 years. Our focus is uh, ideation in third places like pubs and breweries and, and things of that sort. So that's where we kind of nurture ideas. Our aspirations is to be a, um, a feeder organization to ecosystems and really kind of really scrape the individuals, groups, communities, and really push those ideas forward in some fashion and connect people in that manner. But focus has been on uh, more social innovation kind of things like affordable housing and things like that, but we want to expand in some other areas. And uh, interesting enough, Joy and I are trying to do a napkin to prototype type of uh of collaboration where we take the napkin essentially and really drive it into some some level of of uh a prototype so we can pitch it out to uh, the ecosystem so that's where we're at now so glad to be here glad to have you uh dean our fearless leader well uh thank you craig and welcome everyone um Aaron, I, it's hard to believe I was uh, seeing everybody. I think you, me, and Michael might be the last one standing from the very, very early days. We've actually entrepreneurship and how to support uh, the uh, those who support entrepreneurs and small businesses has been something that Ten at the Top has, has worked on uh, really since the very beginning, about 13 um, years ago. And I, uh, Terrence, I'm pretty sure you're just a Ten at the Top groupie. Uh, so it, you can admit that uh, Terrence is. Uh, I am. I, I can't. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah, he's our past chair, so he just can't. He just he was our Zoom uh, chair during the Zoom um, COVID years. So I don't think you can, you you just have to be on these Zooms, Terrence. I believe. Um, and I am so impressed, Craig. You have a neuroscientist and someone from uh, one of the other upstates. Uh, on your call. So uh, it's you are just uh, uh, really cranking and we are so glad to have uh, Craig with us. And, and of course, Aaron um, really uh, laid the foundation has done great work uh, for years. So uh, David, welcome. I am really looking forward. I have skimmed through your book. I, I had intended on reading it all before now and it just hasn't happened, but I have looked through some of it and it looks very interesting and I'm really excited uh, to hear from you today, and I appreciate you being with us, though, unfortunately, uh, you don't get to enjoy uh, um, the upstate, uh, although today is not a day to enjoy it with the rain, but uh, uh, hopefully someday we'll get to host you here in person. That's, that's great. That'd be lovely. That's, that's the Southern welcome he was looking for. Uh, Karen, you joined us. Uh, you want to just introduce yourself real quickly? Oh, I didn't hear most people's introductions. I guess I was like a minute late. Um, but uh, what do you want to know about me? I'm a realtor in the upstate of South Carolina, residential. 
And I love meeting people and helping people. Thank you. All right, David Ehrlichman. Um, I'll let you do the official bio stuff. I, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, working um, with David um, in a group uh, that was funded by the Irvine Foundation of the Irvine uh, Foundation decided that uh, communities needed to be more connected and not have silos. And they ran an experiment in Fresno. And um, as everything from doctors to school board members to, I mean, electeds to farmers to everything in between uh, and ran multiple cohorts and connecting a community. And uh, so I was always very impressed with David's work. And then when his book came out and I read it and I was watching the other people on LinkedIn talking about how big an effect it had, I thought this would be a great, uh, a great resource for us as a community to hear from David, but if you want to take a deeper dive in and, and read his book, it would be a really great kind of a base um, knowledge set for us. Yay, there we go. Michelle's holding it up for you. Um, uh, so that as we're all working together, building this, this uh, ecosystem, which is really a network, that we could all be kind of operating from the same uh, principles in the book. So that was my thought behind calling David, who I hadn't spoken to for a couple of years, uh, and, and asking him if he would join us for one of our quarterly meetings and um, really give us what, I mean, what, what you've seen in my postings is really how I think about this, is most of us are sort of natural networkers, and I don't mean just showing up at network meetings, but in creating networks. Um, but like with most things, if you're self-taught, you kind of reach a certain ceiling in your efforts. And it's kind of nice to go back and learn from someone who's really studied it, practiced it, seen all of these things a thousand times and then uh, be able to take that knowledge and really advance all of our work uh, individually and collectively. So that um, more than an introduction is really, I want you to know the reason behind uh, my choice for, for uh, this quarter speaker. So um, now I get to just say, David, uh, yeah, like I said, I've always been impressed with your work and it just continues to grow and I think the next phase of what David's going to do is really going to be mind blowing. So you're getting a get a little bit of an inside uh, peek into that as well. So, David, I'll hand it over to you, just like I handed over the hosting. Thanks, Greg. And hi, everybody. It's it's really great to be here with you. And I, I love seeing kind of the connections already being made just through those introductions. Uh, you know, that's something I might call weaving, like weaving the threads of connectivity, the, the mycelial networks or the fungal networks underneath the forest floor that that help trees grow because no tree grows in isolation. Right. And that's the same as as our organizations and our communities. And um, you know, I originally uh, thought I was going to be a, a business entrepreneur. Uh, and then and so I worked at a, at a startup to see what that experience would be like and then kind of realized partly through that that. I really wanted uh, the focus of my work to to drive social impact, and so I thought I was going to be a social entrepreneur uh, and studied that, and and worked in, in a nonprofit uh, to to get some exposure to that. Um, uh, the first business entrepreneur, kind of following my older brother's footsteps, social entrepreneur, kind of following my older sister's footsteps, and <clears throat> when I was working at that nonprofit, I saw how they were doing incredible work supporting. The lives of individual people. They helped them get trained in and find jobs in the food industry uh, here in Seattle, where I'm based, uh, where there's a, a big, uh, you know, chronic lack of affordable housing. And and I saw though how they were really constrained by kind of the the annual cycle of fundraising and where the fundraising dollars had to be tied to really specific outcomes, and and that kind of caused them to be. You know, 
pretty insular and, and really focused on their individual work. Totally makes sense, but but really didn't collaborate with or even coordinate with other organizations across the city who, you know, who also were uh, affected by and affecting this issue in a number of different ways. You know, homelessness, lack of affordable housing, it's an issue that no single organization can, can address on their own. And so from that, I started to get really curious about how we could work not just within individual organizations, uh, although that's also essential, but strengthen the, the systems. How can we strengthen the connections between organizations and even across sectors to, to increase our ability to work collectively at that systemic level? And, and that's what led me to, uh, to first a uh, consulting firm called Monitor Institute, which is a social impact focused uh, firm. And, and it was there that I was really exposed to lots of different kind of network-based approaches to drive impact. Uh, sometimes it was creating a, a deliberate network or coalition that brought multiple organizations together around a common issue, like the REAMP network brings over uh, 160 organizations across the Midwest to uh, reduce carbon emissions across nine states. And th that network is really deliberate, it, you know, has staff, uh, but then I also saw how organizations were really taking a network approach to their work. Uh, this is organizations like Kaboom, which helps to build playgrounds in, in low-income neighborhoods. And they've scaled their impact not by scaling up, not by building a bigger and bigger organization, but by scaling out, by connecting with working on the ground with organizations who are there local in their communities, who have the connections, who have have the, the understanding of what their community needs, and then supporting, catalyzing those local organizations to do what's necessary to galvanize the community and, and ultimately build a playground. So rather than scaling up, scaling out. And that was, that was kind of mind blowing for me. It's like, wow, we can, we can expand our impact through connections, through deliberate process of increasing flows of information and resources, coordinating our efforts, and then ultimately collaborating to do things together that we can't do alone. So from that experience, I, I left that consulting firm and, and as Craig said, ended up in Fresno, California for about three years as one of the founding coordinators for that network that was really cross-sector network to help revitalize the city and, and, and saw there, I learned so much, but how then the power of relationships made such a big difference when people might disagree on nine out of 10 things, but if you dig deep enough, you might find a slice of common ground or common value that you can agree on and use that as a foundation upon which you can start to, to find opportunities to work together. Or even if, you, even if you can't do that, maybe you have a greater understanding and appreciation for each other's perspectives and it opens a new, new line of communication that can lead to something positive. From that, I... I co-founded a, a network called Converge and, and grew to 14 people who were building and supporting these types of multi-stakeholder collaborative networks. And that's, that's what I've been doing over much of the past 12 years, uh, working with over 50 different of these impact networks all around the world. And, and the benefit of, of that work of playing many different roles and lots of different contexts is, is seeing the common patterns that have arisen. Right. Each one of these collaboratives is so different in terms of the region and the history of the place and the people and the purpose, but there's so much that has been similar in terms of how they begin and the type of resources that are required, the type of leadership roles that are necessary and the, the processes and practices they've used to, to grow and expand and ultimately increase their impact. And, and that's what I, I captured uh, in this book. And, this book really builds on the good work of so many different people. Uh, it's partly from my experience, the experience of the Converge Network, but really it's also a culmination of works from across the field. And uh, you know, folks like June Holly and Baldus Krebs, Madeline Taylor, and community organizers, community builders, community development, systems thinking, network thinking, lots of different disciplines. And, you know, I've been dedicated my career to exploring this type of how can we coordinate better 
to, to create real impact and get things done, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and share this with you today. And hopefully, you know, you're all, you're all so experienced in, in your work. I can tell from, from your introductions and have deep, deep expertise in, in your fields. I, I hope there's something in here that I'll, I'll share today uh, that, that you might be able to take and, and apply to the things that you care about. So to kind of kick us off, we did, we did individual check-ins, individual introductions, but I want to just do one question as sort of a collective check-in. And if, if in the chat, you will click that link, uh, or if you want to type it directly into your internet browser, it's pollev.com slash 426 for today's date, April 26. But you should just be able to click that link in the chat and that will have a question, which is what are the most important ingredients for impactful collaboration from your perspective? Try to keep it to, to one word if you can. You can add in multiple, but this is gonna create kind of a word cloud from this group, what, what you all think are the most important ingredients of impactful collaboration. I just wanna see what comes up to help set the stage for, for what I'm gonna share. So go ahead and click that link add in what you think are the most important ingredients for impactful collaboration and I will uh, should pop up right now and I, I will share my screen and also read them off. And if you're driving, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak them out loud. It's, Let me know not, it's not letting me get into it, but I, I, maybe you have to, you have to log in. I just skipped the login process. You shouldn't have to log in. Uh, no, maybe... I didn't, and I'm having the same thing. It says enter response, and I'm getting the old uh, red. Uh... Uh oh, that's not good. Maybe uh, ref could you refresh your refresh your screen, please? Yeah. Uh, still get the little it's red. Voting has not out. been turned on. Voting has not been turned on. Oh no. All right, maybe that won't work. Uh, well, maybe y'all can uh, just shout it out then. What do you think are the, the most important ingredients is for, for impactful collaboration? Listening. Trust. Making sure the polling device works. So bring it all yeah. together. <laughs> Mutual respect. A common vision laid out uh, well um, with some initial wins that you can build out. Responsiveness. Sincerity. Focus. Love it. Keeping an open mind. Patience. Authenticity. Beautiful. That's awesome. Well, thanks for shouting it out. Uh, the web voting has been turned on, but I think we got it. Uh, and and that's uh, that'll actually be captured better in the recording anyway. And for those who are driving, so maybe that was a good thing. Uh, I'm going to share some of the key lessons uh, that have come up through through this work over the past decade plus, and what I've learned from from the research and interviewed uh, many dozens of different network leaders through this process too. To, to really capture their stories. And uh, as, I, as I go through it, please feel free to, to add questions in the chat. I'll do my best to keep up with that and whatever I can't get to on the fly will return to at the end. So I'm gonna, uh, maybe Craig, if you could make me a host again, I will share my screen. And, and, and David, in. one of us yep. could monitor the chat for you, which might allow you to not be distracted. It's it's a really good point. Yeah, I appreciate it, Michael. I mean, maybe Craig can take that role yep. on. Yep, I was just uh, unmuting to tell you that I'll be watching it as well. Fantastic. All right. So, you know, why why do we do this this kind of multi stakeholder cross sector work? Well, you know, we live in a really complex world uh, that that complexity is is increasing rapidly and. We have all these issues that we're facing, whether it's addressing social inequities or providing economic opportunity for all, whatever it is, these are issues that can't be solved by single action or individual organizations. They're systemic issues, and that means we 
have to work systemically to address them. And people and organizations embark on collaborative efforts all the time. We often think we know how to do that really well, but, but often we're I've noticed that we're really frustrated by the results. And uh, there's a, you know, a term out there called collaboration fatigue, right? So many different meetings you're a part of, so many different collaborations that are starting that don't quite fulfill on their promise or potential. And why, why does that happen? Well, often there's personality conflicts uh, and, and a lack of trust. Someone mentioned trust and a lack of listening. Someone mentioned that too. And often I've noticed it's, it's because people are trying to structure these collaborations like they would an organization as a hierarchy with some central authority guiding the work and fitting people into you know, predefined specific roles to move it forward, trying to plan it all out in advance and identifying the specific measurable outcomes for the effort before people have even had the opportunity to come together, to make sense of it together and to discover what they can and want to do together. That really deliberate approach, that kind of predicting control approach only works if we already know what needs to be done and how to do it. But these complex issues are experienced really differently by different people. People are affected by these issues uh, in different ways. The, like this art installation, they see things really differently depending on where they stand. And, and actually like, no single person, no, no single brain can hold all the complexity of these systems all at once. It really requires bringing people together from different parts of the system, different actors who have expertise or awareness of different areas and different experiences to bring our different perspectives together, to kind of bring our puzzle pieces together, to make sense of what's happening, to strengthen our ability to share information and resources, and then ultimately to coordinate our efforts more effectively and affect the system, start to shift it in a positive direction. We can't, can't solve these complex issues. There's often no definitive endpoint, but we can address them from many different angles at once to start to move them in a positive direction. And that's really what it means to build a network for impact, a deliberate effort to create connection and coordination and collaboration across the system around a common issue. And of course, people have always formed networks, right? We've always worked in community with others to solve challenges that we can't on our own. And and so in many ways, I'm really talking about a return to the ways that people have naturally connected with one another for as long as we've been around in community, in relationship, and kind of an unlearning of the top-down command and control model that's been imposed on so much of the world. And that I know I, I was certainly socialized in, in, in school and through all my jobs. You know, there was initial jobs, there was always a boss and a chain of command you know, passing down the orders. And so we can we can build on lessons from, from social movements and community building and indigenous wisdom and generations of people who have worked in these collective ways for thousands of years, and then also incorporate lessons from network science, new technologies that enable us to coordinate at larger scales and across time zones than ever before, and, and sit in, in, in engaging systems thinking and, and you know, introducing these practices for bringing communities and organizations together. And ultimately, what does it come down to? You know, bringing people around a common purpose and building the connections around that common purpose. I love this quote from Meg Wheatley. Change doesn't happen one person at a time. It happens as networks of relationships form among people who discover they share a common cause and a vision for what's possible. That's really, that's really what this book is about, right? The, the tagline is how can we create connections, spark collaboration and catalyze systemic change? So over the course of the next few minutes, I'm gonna share with you how networks form and the really the practices for, for getting them to a point where they're creating impact. So first, what are networks? At their most basic, networks are just webs of relationships, connecting people or things. So they're all different kinds of networks, right? They're all around us. There are neural networks in our brains. This is the map of how the parts of a mouse's brain are connected. There are technological networks like the internet. This map shows the data flows between the different routers and cables that make up the physical infrastructure of the internet. There are mycelial networks or fungal networks underneath forest floors that connect trees and plants together to transfer water and, uh, water and carbon and nitrogen. 
and other nutrients and minerals between them. And then we all know about social networks. If you mapped out all of your social connections, if you drew a line between yourself and then the people who knew each other, it would look something like this. Most social networks tend to form pretty organically as you, as you get a new job, as you move to a new community, you start to connect with people. But what many people don't realize is that networks can be deliberately organized to do so much more than just foster connection, right? When networks connect individuals and organizations for deliberate learning and collaborative action around a shared purpose, that's what we call impact networks. And you know, this isn't some experimental type of work. It's really happening all over the world uh, and in so many different areas. Uh, some of the examples I show here and lots of others I dig into in the book. Just a couple to call out. Smile Spokane is aligning the work of over a dozen organizations to reduce oral health disparities in Spokane County, Washington. Uh, I mentioned the REAMP, 160 organizations working to reduce carbon emissions across nine states in the Midwest. The Justice in Motion Defender Network is connecting human rights organizations across borders in Central America to protect migrant rights and, and, and on and on and on. So these are the common patterns that I've seen between them. What is the key shift, uh, the mindset shift that's necessary when we are uh, bringing people into these networks or what it takes to engage people in these networks? Well, most organizations, most organizational leaders tend to operate on a daily basis, seeing themselves, their organizations at sort of the center of the universe or at least the center of your focus. And it makes total sense, all the funding pressures I mentioned before. Many other stakeholders situated around you that you could collaborate with to further your own mission. But the shift here, the network mindset, is to see ourselves as part of an interconnected system of different actors and different organizations. We're not the sun at the center of the solar system, even though we're usually the heroes of our own stories. We are one star and our organizations are one star in this huge and diverse constellation. So rather than putting your organization at the center of your focus, try putting the shared purpose at the center. What is the core issue that you or your organization care about and are focused on that many other groups also care about and are also touching in different ways? Once we are able to put that shared purpose at the center, then we can see the other actors across the ecosystem and actually work to deliberately strengthen those connections and the flows of information between them. And that's really what it means to build a network. It's also the first step to building a network is, is finding that shared purpose. And so how these networks often form, you know, relationally, it looks like this. First, people and organizations often work in scattered fragments, right? Some are connected, sharing information, in different clusters, maybe different parts of the region, but there's not something that's deliberately bringing the whole system together. And so what's necessary is to find that shared purpose and usually for someone or some organization to see the opportunity to del deliberately connect different parts of the system. This is that hub, that central hub, the catalyst that brings groups together for the first time. But importantly, we need to move ultimately beyond this stage because right now the system, these many different clusters and organizations are connected to each other, but just through that central hub, if the individual organization were to leave, the connections holding the whole system together would disappear. And so we want these networks to evolve into a multi-hub network that's not dependent on any single person or organization where resources and information are flowing from person to person, organization to organization without having to go through some centralized entity. And then over time, you can see it forms this highly dense core of activity and then a larger periphery of people who are engaging at different times. Of course, these pictures are static, but really this is a very fluid process. And it's normal that not everybody will participate at the same level all the time. And the goal is not actually to get 100% engagement all the time. This, this usually is something that uh, helps the facilitators or coordinators at the center of these efforts relax uh, because it's just not possible. People are going to come in and out different levels of engagement. We're busy. We have different things that we have prioritized. 
So usually the, the rule of thumb that we've seen is up in 20% of people at any given time are really actively engaged in helping move things forward as leads. About 40% are you know, showing up for meetings, they're collaborating, they're responsive. And about another 40% they're kind of on the email list. Once in a while, they'll chime in, but but often sort of MIA. And then there's a larger periphery of people who, who might come in at different times. So this is a normal kind of distribution. To give a specific example, the Fresno network that, that Craig mentioned and was a part of how these networks form and what we can even learn from this type of relationship mapping. This was the map of connections that was uh, created via a survey, self-reported survey data before the first cohort ever met together for the first time. Uh, the, the circles or the nodes here represent the individual organizational leaders who are part of this network. And the connecting line in this case represents a, uh, a relationship between two members, meaning they, they have some foundation of goodwill and they're sharing information with one another. And you can see there were some connections, but uh, other folks were, were less connected, a little bit on the periphery. We deliberately connected the group together over the next three months. You can see, okay, yay, we have, we have this well-connected network. But what got really interesting is when, when we brought in the second cohort of 12 leaders and did another map, looks pretty well-connected, but now if you color these nodes, not by, this is by sector, but if you color it by cohort, you can actually see two pretty clear clusters or groups of people, one in cohort one and one in cohort two, much more connected with each other than they were uh, across cohorts. So this told us as facilitators, we need to be much more deliberate about weaving these connections across the different cohorts. This was even more stark when you brought in the third cohort of 12, which if we're on the periphery, right? The first 24 people had already had enough context and history with one another building those relationships. And now the next group is sort of on the outside looking in. My favorite view though of this is when we color it by the type of work that people were focused on. If the, the blue uh, nodes here represent people who were working in health and human rights organizations, the green nodes are those who are working in education and nonprofit organizations. And then the pink nodes are those who are working in government and business organizations. We showed this to the room, Craig, you might remember, uh, at one of the convenings. And why this was so stark is because we'd been hearing and people had been talking about with one another that in Fresno, it was really common for the business and government folks to, to be really well connected, to have lots of conversations, to be making deals or decisions with one another. And leaders from other sectors, other organizations, kind of felt like they were on the outside of these conversations. And, and this was maybe the first kind of empirical data that actually showed this was happening. And even in this network of 36, where the intention was to work across sectors and, and build new types of connections. And if you had looked around the room, you would have seen the government and the business people sitting together right, in that very space. And so, really seeing ourselves as part of the system and kind of from a bird's eye view, what is the connectivity of the system? Like it raised the self-awareness of, oh, I can actually, I should be more deliberate about kind of reaching you know, across the aisle or across boundaries uh, to connect with people from different parts of the system, maybe with perspectives that disagree with my own. And then over time, what we can show is that this was not just a network. And this is, this is the case of 10 at the top. And, and, and the network of folks just here in this room. You know, this is not just a network of 36 leaders, it's a network of networks because everybody here and everybody on this Zoom call has connections with countless other leaders or people who can help contribute to the causes you care about. So while the, the, kind of the media network was 36 people, if you also included, other, we asked who else in Fresno would be an important asset for this network and for a vitalization of the city that you're well connected with already, over 300 different people, right? That anybody in that tight network of 36 has a direct line of connection to a direct line of introduction to within only two degrees of separation. So that's really kind of the, the exponential power of building these types of, these types of networks. 
want to emphasize a point that I, I said quickly, but just didn't want to skip over too 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 fast. And you know, when building these networks, we we want to move beyond that hub and spoke stage where there's a central entity that's that's controlling the whole thing and that is totally that the network is totally dependent on. Because if you stop at that hub and spoke stage, which you see on the right here, you're really just creating another hierarchy, right? If you look, these two diagrams are actually structurally identical. They're just visualized in different ways. So being at the top of a hierarchy or the center of that rigid hub and spoke network it has its benefits. Right? You're more likely to be in control. You're more likely to be needed, but it also has its cost. And the more you control, the less people are able to self-organize to advance work on their own. And the more you're needed, the less resilient the system is in the event that you're unavailable. You might create un unintentionally a bottleneck and constrict that flow of information. So, so instead, the goal is not just to connect groups together through you or your organization, it's to create really a vibrant ecosystem of connection where people are able to self-organize to take action in new ways that's not totally dependent on one centralized entity. But at the same time, I don't want to paint hierarchies as bad or inherently worse than networks. They're not. They're just really good at different things. Right? Networks are really well suited for that complex type of, of issues or challenges where we don't know exactly what needs to, gun, to get done or how to do it, where we need to bring our different perspectives together and identify what, what needs to happen. And then when we do bring it down from the complex to more of a complicated level where we can plan things out in advance and and assign different roles and delegate responsibilities, that's when hierarchies are really useful. So really I'm gonna advocate for blending network and hierarchical structures, just fitting them when appropriate. People have lots of experience usually working in hierarchies though. And so working in networks can often feel really different. Uh, it requires a different approach and a different mindset. Hierarchies typically detail, uh, develop detailed plans to achieve predetermined goals. They have really deliberate processes to produce defined outcomes, right? Like the rowers on the left here, everyone's in their seat. They're, they're rowing in the same direction at the same time. They know exactly where they're going to end up and about how long it's going to take them to get there. On the other hand, networks are kind of more like a, a flotilla of kayaks, right? A group of autonomous vessels that uh, sometimes are going into the unknown together. Right. They might have a, an idea of where they want to end up or going down this river, this, this course, right? we have our North Star, but along the way, right, each kayak, each, each member of a network, each organization has agency and choice, you know, free to adjust course to accommodate your own circumstances and needs. But the journey unfolds as the whole group is responding to each other and to their environment staying in close communication, notifying each other about what they're seeing and sensing and interested in exploring. And by going together, can go farther than they could by going alone. Just one more metaphor here. Rather than building a machine or a structure, which we can plan out to exact specifications, like the bridge, we're building a bridge from point A to point B, we can have a really clear blueprint. People have built bridges many times before, we can follow those models. Creating an impact network is more like cultivating a garden and no two gardens are exactly the same because every plant grows in relationship with its neighbors and the soil and the climate. And it's also not possible to grow a garden overnight. It takes time for the plants to develop no matter how much attention you give them. But what we can do is we can cultivate the conditions for gardens to thrive and for networks to thrive. We can provide the nutrients and the water and the sunlight plants need to grow, we can pull weeds and use fertilizer. We can, we can even provide a bit of structure in the form of stakes or trellises that these plants can, can hang on to as they grow. And we can lay paths through the garden that people can follow. And at the same time though, if we, if we try to impose our influence too much on nature, on gardens, if we walk on the plants or we water too much, we might mess things up. So it's about how can we cultivate these networks with care without trying to force them or control them. So we can support networks, we can cultivate them, but controlling them is really counterproductive. And it's actually what leads to a lot of that collaboration fatigue. And networks are, they're living systems. So they draw on lessons for how nature works, right? Like a memoration of starlings. An important thing I, I wanna show here, this graphic is you know, they are these swirling collectives that change shape and adapt in real time. And it's, 
almost never the case that everybody in network is going to be even agreeing on what to do or doing the same thing together. Actually, some groups will spin off and, and advance one piece of work. Another group will spin off and advance another piece of work. And that's okay. It's not about all trying to agree on exactly what needs to be done. I mean, that that's what I would call a coalition type of network, but it's a really kind of directed type of network. If you can get there, great, but but if you can't, that's okay, right? Networks are really about increasing the flows of information, the flows of resources, the opportunities for greater levels of coordination across the system and enabling people to, to form smaller groups and take action where they think it's necessary, not necessarily requiring that everybody does the same thing all the time. So, how are networks actually formed? These are the five core activities that we see over and over again. Clarify purpose and principles, convene the people, cultivate trust, coordinate actions, and then collaborate for systems change. These activities are dynamic and they're interdependent. It's not like you check one and you're done, right? They loop back and forth on each other as the network evolves. So you're constantly aware of them and constantly revisiting these activities throughout a network's life cycle. So just to go through each in brief, clarifying purpose and principles. Purpose is what inspires people to join and contribute their time and energy, right? These networks can't be controlled, but they can be, should be oriented around a shared purpose or common vision. And then as the network identifies its purpose, it's also helpful to articulate shared principles. These are the fundamental beliefs about how network members intend to conduct themselves and work together in pursuit of that purpose. It's really putting values into actions like principles are operationalized values. It's how to hold each other accountable to what the network says is important. And principles are really what hold social movements together a lot when it's lots of groups, very diffuse, working on very different things in different regions, but have a, set, have a shared purpose and have a set of shared principles that they can hold each other accountable to. And that creates some coherence even when they're really diffuse. So then convening the people, we create opportunities for people to become connected. That can be virtual, ideally in person, if you can, sometimes individually, and, and but often all at once. I, almost every network that I studied took the act of convenings very seriously, really trying to, to bring together as large of a subset of a network as possible from time to time. Sometimes it was just once a year, sometimes it was more frequent, especially in place-based networks. And, so who do we bring together in these networks? We bring together Adrian Mir Brown has said, those who number one, are directly impacted by the issue at hand. Number two, those who are doing compelling work on the issue. And then number three, those who can move the work forward, right? So convening people, again, not the center of the world, convening people doesn't mean inviting them into your thing. It means inviting them into co-creating what's possible now that they're part of the group. And every person who joins these networks should have the opportunity, but also shared responsibility to contribute to its development. And then we cultivate trust. We, we don't build trust so that we like each other. We actually don't need to like each other to be able to work together. We definitely don't build trust so that we agree with one another. It's actually so that we can disagree, so that we can have the hard conversations that are necessary so that we can you know, hold the tension through the inevitable disagreements and miscommunications, hold the tension so we can hang in there long enough when the temperature starts to rise in the room, hang in there long enough until we can either find that slice of common ground, where we can agree, we can start working on that thing at least, and that maybe is a basis for future collaboration, or at least have a greater shared understanding of each other's perspectives. And, Trust doesn't usually actually have to take a long time to develop. We can often develop a kind of baseline level of trust or what you might call goodwill in a short amount of time if we go about it deliberately. And one of the practices that we've used a lot is kind of getting people in circles like this and asking them to share the story of something and meaningfully sharing the story and having other people meaningfully listen over five minutes. And the key on that exercise, uh, and there's actually a, a facilitator's walkthrough if you if you want to check it out on the Converge website, converge.net slash toolkit. It's called True Stories. The key is to have the speaker, the, the storyteller, 
jarring for five minutes straight and everybody else isn't saying anything. They're just listening. The person just has the floor and everybody else, it's, a, it's an exercise in really active listening. And the kind of stories you can share, one of the, in a, in a network of various organizations I was a part of to, to steward half a million acres in the Santa Cruz Mountains region, where you have to bring together the government agencies and the nonprofits and the land trusts and the timber companies and the tribal groups, all how are we gonna effectively care for this land? Uh, we, we put deliberately the, the head of the timber company and the head of the, the environmental organization, which was called Save the Redwoods, in the same group and had them share the story about what the land meant to them. And they came in like disagreeing and butting heads on a lot of different things, uh, but saw that they, they both had some like shared experiences of the land and they both had a shared care for the land. And, and even if they had really different perspectives about the right way to do things, they had that, that foundation, uh, foundational values that started to then open up more channels of communication between them. And ultimately I ended up actually uh, doing a, a massive uh, collaborative project together where the environmental organization bought a big chunk of land and enabled the timber company to do some sustainable timber harvesting on that land. And then we coordinate, coordinate actions. This is really kind of identifying the things that are already happening and helping to connect the dots. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to come up with new things that we're gonna do. What's already happening and how would we create greater awareness of those things that are happening and start to support each other's work in those ways. And creating stronger flows of information and knowledge and resources. And those flows create stronger systems. This was uh, a network that was 50 organizations working to increase economic mobility across New York City. And over the course of a couple of years, these connecting lines are, are regular flows of communication between these organizational leaders. And you can see, if you go about it deliberately, you can create these systems where there's information flowing and people are then naturally finding ways to work with one another, even if it's not something you could plan out in advance. And then finally, in addition to coordinating the things that we're already doing, Sometimes it is necessary to, to collaborate in new ways, collaborate for systems change. That requires making collective sense of what's happening in the system from many different perspectives, bringing our pieces of the puzzle together and, and identifying points of leverage where a small shift of one thing could produce big changes in everything that Danola Meadows has written about. And then forming uh, teams or delegating responsibilities, sometimes forming little hierarchical structures to actually go execute on those opportunities that come up. In the case of the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, that environmental stewardship network I mentioned just a second ago, uh, one of the things that came up was uh, that all of their work and their organizations were at huge risk of the catastrophic wildfires that are a huge problem in that region. And so that was something that a big group of these organizations could agree on. And they ended up pooling their data sources together for the first time and identifying opportunities to, to reduce the risk of that catastrophic wildfire. And another example, they, they recognized that the permitting processes for important restoration, environmental restoration work were incredibly pricey and onerous, costly, and basically the same as building a new condo. And so they ultimately started an initiative called Cutting Green Tape, which got taken up by the state and, and reduced those, those burdensome permitting processes for that work. Uh, I won't go too into this, but uh, some groups choose to do kind of a systems mapping effort where they're asking people across the network, across the system, what are the key challenges we face with respect to this core issue and then how those challenges relate to one another. Uh, and then through that can discover what those, those leverage points might be. Uh, I, won't, I won't go more into that, but if you're curious, you can search 100K in 10, uh, the number is 100 and K in 10, come in the lower left there, and then search 100K in 10 grand challenges and they walk you through how they created this system map. And lastly, two more points uh, and I'll close. So impact networks, these networks, they need structure also, and it's like organizations, but not too much structure, kind of a minimum viable structure, right? Just enough to provide support like a trellis in a garden, not too much 
to stifle emergence and creativity, but enough to provide support. You have that enabling infrastructure, things like mechanisms for performing teams or online communication platforms, processes for making collective decisions and participation agreements. Uh, how do we gather and distribute resources? That essential infrastructure that can grow alongside the network. Very often, we don't need to plan it all out in advance. As the network grows and evolves, we'll discover where a little bit more structure is needed and we can build it alongside the evolution. And then finally, many people assume that, that networks like this just happen, that people will self-organize spontaneously. That's actually extremely rare. Uh, spont and spontaneous self-organization usually only goes so far. The real truth is that leadership always matters. It's just a really different form of leadership than we see in hierarchical environments. So rather than define predefining structures and rules, it's about nurturing this culture of connectivity and reciprocity. Instead of command and control, these network leaders seek to connect and collaborate, right? They're not there to tell people what to do, but to cultivate the conditions for the network to thrive, to foster self-organization and support people to discover what they can and wanna to do together. And these network leaders, facilitators, coordinators, they're so often what make the difference, but they're usually so humble and so quick to share the credit, part what makes them great at the role, and that we, we rarely ever know who they are or resource them in the way they should. And it's been part of my mission to raise the profile of these, these individuals who are kind of at the core of these efforts and, and not taking the credit, but helping to, to cultivate those conditions so that people can, can do the work they wanna to do together. And there are four, four roles, different network leadership roles that I've seen come up over and over again. The act of catalyzing networks, bringing people together for the first time or catalyzing a new conversation in the network or catalyzing a working group or team. Often, very often, the people who catalyze networks to come together in the first time are not the best people to continue to coordinate it and facilitate it, right? So, so in many, many cases, somebody is great at bringing people together, but then it's appropriate for them to step back and to support other people to step into these other leadership roles, like facilitation, people who are skilled at leading meetings and designing convenings and helping to, to bring different perspectives together. Weaving, people who are, I already saw on this call, some people are naturally gifted at identifying potential points of connection and helping to introduce people together, weaving the threads across the network. And then coordination, Someone who's paying attention to all the back of the house stuff, keeping people engaged, uh, handling the communication system and, uh, and all those types of things, totally essential, um, but, but often really behind the scenes. All right, lastly, as I, as I leave you, just to double down on a point uh, that I learned a long time ago in Fresno, it's so much of this work is about relationships. That's really what makes it work. And networks, networks are, webs of connections, uh, webs of relationships, connecting people are things. So they're as strong as the connections that tie them together. So if at any point you're unsure about how to proceed in this work, invest in relationships, right? return on, seek a return on relationships. And this is really how these fragmented systems can become creative and adaptive and interconnected holes. So thank you, uh, happy to, to dig into questions. I, uh, you can, feel free to come off mute. And, and just to um, name, there's lots of resources online on the Converb website that are all free. They're open source, that's converge.net. Uh, there's a, a toolkit there with survey questions and with framing questions and, and facilitation guides of, of, some, of uh, some of our favorite tools. So I hope you do go use that. Uh, and then there's also a, a documentary video uh, documentary film short documentary uh, called impact networks that that interviews six people around the world and you might find that interesting too so uh, happy to answer any questions and if there are no questions i have uh one more thing i can michael uh, michael can has his hand up no no i was just i was just clapping Oh, you're just clapping. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you. I have a question, um, David. Great. Uh, you made, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your time. And um, one, a couple points that really stood out to me. 
was your emphasis on um, the importance of networks and ecosystems is that being that you you were enabled the network is enabled to access information and resources more freely um, and and then I think you kind of um, well for me this kind of relates to one of your last points as far as leadership and developing culture so I think on both sides whether we're dealing um, with the flow of information from the network standpoint and the enabling of that flow from the leadership standpoint, there's still really the challenge of getting us as people to transition into this way of operation. So my, um, my question for you is for the leader, how do we address um, the the issue in our network or in our community that people just aren't used to spontaneously taking advantage of a free flow of information and resources for this almost self-driven spontaneous change? Mm. And then on a leadership level, how do we also kind of like uh, you know, to even get to that point, how do we step out of maybe some of our uh, hierarchical model training into into this new style of leadership? Yeah, I mean, awesome questions, uh, big questions. But the first one, uh, the first one, I found that you know, giving people an example of the type of impact that that flow of information can have, uh, kind of in real time then leads them to be more likely to share and be responsive in kind of virtual or, or online environments. Uh, for example, one of the tools on, on that site is called Rapid Coordination, and it's something that I do almost at every network convening, times we bring people together, whether it's virtual or online, and that's giving people the opportunity to share requests and offers. And so you know, one by one, uh, enabling people to raise their hand and say, here's something that I need, right? I need a conference room to, to host a group of people, or I need some transportation, or I need connections to a grant writer or whatever it is. And then give space for other people to raise their hand and say, you know, I can connect with that, or I can connect you with X, Y, Z or whatnot. Uh, that's not the point. That's not the time for a conversation between those two people, because you want to keep it moving, but that's the time just to make the connection and then they'll follow up after the meeting. And so each person takes like only 20 seconds. You can go on to the next person. Something I need is blank. Then who can help with that? Raise their hands. Okay, write, write down all their names. Go to the next person. Keep it moving. And then you can, once that's done, do the same thing as offers. What's something you might be able to offer to this group to support others' work, right? I've done a lot of research on X. I'm happy to share that data with you. Or I, you know, I, I have access to uh, trucks that we don't use on the weekend. And then other people write down that person's name yes. and they follow up. And it's, that's always a pretty mind-blowing moment for people. It's like, wow, that's actually the power of the network, right? In 30 minutes, each person got something that they need to support their own work and to really serve their self-interest. And that's that's an important piece of this is to to be able to acknowledge our self-interests, right? We often come together around a thing, a shared interest, but if people aren't getting something out of it that makes it work for them or their organization or their constituents, they're not really gonna be able to engage and they're not gonna be incentivized to continue to engage. So once that kind of exercise happens, then we point people to, you know, you can continue to share, to, to share these requests. We have a space for you to share these requests and offers as they come up now into the future on, Slack or whatever your communication system is and create a space for people to do that. And then you'll see the activity there increase and people see the opportunity for that. Um, the question about how to get into this mindset and everything is that's kind of uh, like, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there. There are some trainings that are useful, I think, but really it's just kind of getting into it. And I found that the best way is to, to uh, invite people to these types of convenings and make them a really different experience than they, would normally expect like it's not just another meeting 
right? You're not just going through kind of a normal agenda and Robert's Rules of Borders and stuff. It's like, actually, how do we connect deeply as humans and, and share things we're passionate about and, and find ways to work together and like get to the really the deep issues that we are usually afraid to talk about and just make it a really different type of experience. And, and, and in those convenings, people will also get a sense of, of the whole system in the room to the extent that that's possible. You know, you're just one part of this interconnected ecosystem and it starts to create that shift. Um, so hopefully that was uh, at least the first step that's helpful. Thank you, thank you. I, I like that point. And, and I also um, just personally, one thing that has uh, helped me as I as I begin to make that transition is being open to feedback, like letting people know that I'm interacting with that, you know, this is my aim as far as what I'm trying to do. And then now that we've had this interaction, like, like, what did I, how successful was I in, in communicating that in, you know, or in effectuating that in my communications? Mm, great point. And on that note, if anybody has feedback for me, uh, happy to to talk with you, or, or would love to to hear any of your feedback. Uh, you can you can contact me directly. And if you have questions, feel free to email me, um, Ehrlichman at converge.net. And uh, Craig, I know we're running up on time here, so I'll, I'll pass it to you. And just thank thank you everybody for for being here and uh, and for all the work you do. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank thank you. Thank you, David. That was fantastic. Um, really, you got into depth. Um, you know that's that's rare in these kinds of uh, presentations. So really appreciate that, uh, and it was all useful. And and really, even the questions that came up, uh, your ability to give give a useful tool for them is rare. So greatly appreciate having you you join us for this, and I think it will spark a lot of conversations. And it. And it would appear that you were at dinner with me and uh, Phil and uh, Joey last night because um, really we, we were we were starting to get into some of this content that you provided. So this just really amplifies everything. Appreciate it very much. Um, and I appreciate all of you being on. Um, you know, my goal is to continue to add content that's valuable to you as people that are supportive of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, I'm happy to have your uh, input on future ideas as well as I begin to lay out the different meetings. So please feel free to give me suggestions um, or feedback on things that you'd like us to do or us to do better. Um, and I just wanna thank 10 at the top again. I'm really very excited to be involved with 10 at the top because they are natural conveners and pulling together the upstate. And um, as you learn more about this organization, it really will kind of blow your mind at how um, many issues they're getting ahead of so that we aren't just convening around problems, but we're solving things before they become big problems. And again, I just wanna say, as you look across the country and maybe even the world, you know, what a rare thing that is for for us to be able to uh, say, let's identify a problem, we'll work on it, we'll bring the people in the room, and then we'll we'll get ahead of it before it becomes high drama like we see unfolding everywhere. So um, with that, um, I think everyone on here has my email access. I'm really easy to find on all the social media under my name, Craig Sharton. So if you don't have that, Feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything else. All right. Thank you all. And we'll end on time. Bye Thank you, much. Craig. That was great. David, uh, absolutely fantastic. Good to see everybody. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, David. It was very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Happy. <laughs>
in the background that's i'm happy being there so totally. david what would you say about this is this a little bit of a uh, a network flaw or something yeah <laughs> huge <laughs> I, learning I, opportunity I, I just i deserve public shaming i wish erin was still here because um I'm not telling tales on her. I think she would agree that she used to always forget me too. And sometimes if I'm feeling really feisty, I'll just pop in and be like, hey everybody, I'm, I'm here. It's more than it's more than just emails and there's a face. <laughs> there Aaron actually told me to uh, ignore you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. That was really great. Would you yep. feel comfortable sharing? I know the presentation, um, I love that it was so visual without yeah, words, but I'm surprised yeah, no yeah. one asked if we could, if you would share that so we could. I'll share. ask, although I, I screenshotted the, a lot of them. So, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll pass that along to Craig and you can share it. It was beautiful. Yeah, thanks. really great. Yep. Really All great. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Craig, for the invitation. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed dinner. <laughs> I know. Where's our invitation? We're, yeah, we're thank you, background. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Michael, I'll buy you dinner anytime. If you put All up, right. with, There's put a up with me talking, is what what I'm paying you for. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Michael, you were uh, your name did come up several times. It wasn't quite a drinking uh, game with your name, but I think your name came up three or four times. So you uh, were. Uh -oh. <laughs> I know. I wasn't there to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Great session. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Thanks. Bye. I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Yes.